All right, welcome everyone. I'm Tina Panic from the Avon Library. We'd like to welcome you to tonight's lecture, the second in our series in our Paleo, Paleo Indian webinar series for 2021. I'm Tina Panic from the Avon Library. I'm here on behalf of the Avon Library, Avon Historical Society, and Avon Senior Center. Um, just a few quick housekeeping notes. Um, you're, we're in webinar mode tonight, so your camera and your chat will be disabled. You can use the Q&A box to ask any and all questions. We will get to as many as we can at the end. This event is being recorded. We will post it on the Avon Library's YouTube page and it will be available next week. And if you've registered, you will receive the link directly. So you'll be able to rewatch all of your favorite parts. So at this time, I'd like to welcome Terry Wilson so she can introduce Howard. All yours, Terry. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. On behalf of the Avon Historical Society, the Avon Library, the Senior Center, our town historian, and the planning committee for unearthing history, I welcome you to the second educational and informative event of this series. We thank the Farmington Bank Community Foundation for a grant to make all this possible. And I also want to recognize the planning committee who assisted us in putting this together. Mark Banks, local archaeologist who was part of the discovery team, and he is on the he should be on tonight. Nancy Nigerian from the Institute of American Indian Studies in Washington, Connecticut, also with us tonight. Howard Wright, geology teacher at Renbrook School, who's our presenter tonight. And Becky Sal from the Farmington River Watershed Association, also participating tonight. For those of you joining us for the first time, um, I, I welcome. And for your benefit, I'm going to repeat my opening from last time. As some of you may know, the discovery of the Brian Jones Paleo Indian site along the Farmington and River in Avon happened in early 2019. In February 2020, we held the first public presentation about it at the Avon Senior Center. While state and local archaeologists knew for decades there was something very special six feet down at that site, it took federal and state regulations mandating a survey of that area before the State Department of Transportation could build the new bridge. This series is designed to break down information for the general public about the 12,500 year old site. This human occupation site is named for Brian Jones, the state archaeologist who suspected there was something special deep down and was able to see much of it before his untimely death in July of 2019. Tonight we will explore the geology of the region and the river. In May we will learn a deep story of the human settlement of the Farmington Valley. We will take the summer off and begin again in September with a presentation by Dr. Lucy Lavin, who is also on this presentation, who is also watching tonight, about the indigenous people of Connecticut past and present. We will end this first series in October with a detailed update on the three-year analysis of the 15,000 artifacts that were found there. It will be a joint presentation by Dr. David Leslie, who some of you heard at the February 2020 presentation at the Senior Center, and he will be joined by his colleague, Dr. Zach Singer. Both were on site for this discovery. And we expect to run another series in 2020 based on the success of this one and plans for topics and speakers has already begun. So from Pangea to now, this land we are on has changed tremendously, giving us the rich valley most of us live in today. I can bet not many of you may know there are seven rifts that formed thousands of years ago that we drive over every day on Route 44 between Hartford and Canton. And the Farmington River Formation has a lot to do with those. To tell us why and how, I'm pleased to introduce Howard Wright, Science Department Head at Renbrook School, West Hartford, who has been on the faculty since 1980. He has a bachelor's in education from UConn and a master's from Wesleyan University. As part of his early education, he worked at the Dinosaur State Park in Rocky Hill, where he maintains that his mentors there were so wonderful, encouraging him to make science teaching his chosen profession. He'll explain more of that in his talk. But I have to also share with you that it's no accident we found him for this presentation. 10 years ago next week, the same trio of the Historical Society, Library, and Senior Center won several grants over four years to mount exhibits and present events and have special speakers for the 150th commemoration of the Civil War. And one of our very first presenters we had in 2011 was Howard Wright, who, by the way, is also an award-winning first-person portrayer of Abraham Lincoln. Last month, he was profiled in this area's Today magazine. Since 2011, Howard has told us about this valley and how the geology has made it so special. So when this discovery was announced, Howard offered to share his knowledge, as he has done for 40 years, to his science students at Renbrook, which, by the way, 
The school is sitting in a rift valley that you will learn about tonight. So thank you, Howard, for joining us, and I will let you begin. Thank you, Terry. Thanks, Tina. Let me uh, share my screen. And here we go. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for uh, coming by. Uh, I hope that when uh, all this is finished, that you will come away with understanding something even more uh, about things that many of you see every single day. Um, first thing I want to uh, say is that we will be uh, posting these um, at the end, but some shout outs to books that I recommend that you um, look at. Face of Connecticut, uh, Michael Bell, excellent book. Uh, another one is um, uh, Window in the Jurassic World by Nick McDonald and Richard Bergen a beautiful synopsis of not only Dinosaur Park, but the, the whole area, geologically speaking. And since I'm doing a lot of uh, showing you a lot of photos uh, as we go up and down Route 44, uh, another book, uh, Roadside Geology of Connecticut and Rhode Island. Uh, if you really wanna go into greater detail than I can in about an hour, uh, those are three books that I uh, recommend that you uh, take out of your library and uh, read up on. Um, so I have a lot to cover tonight, and uh, the analogy I'm going to draw is uh, I've been a soccer coach, and when you coach soccer, there are 11 players on each side. When you are just starting out, there are too many players, and it just becomes um, a real jumble. So what they do for uh, new um, soccer players is they'll do a seven on seven, make it simpler, get used to the general concepts, and that's what my talk is about tonight. When I talk about the Farmington River, when I talk about geology. So I am going to, hopefully my, my information is accurate, but it will be for the experts somewhat incomplete. If I go through all of the details to make it complete, you, I fear that you will uh, end this program and hearing everything but not remembering uh, that much. So, um, the title of this talk is A Rift Not the River Made the Farmington Valley um, and how the geology of Route 44 um, proves that. Uh, there, this presentation is going to be divided into three parts. Uh, why does the Farmington River flow northward in Avon, Connecticut? Um, can you count seven rock layers while driving on Route 44? And where can you find a big rift valley in Connecticut? Now, if the image that you see here, I took um, on Nod Road in Simsbury, looking at Talcott Mountain. You see the, the high blind tower on the right. So uh, when you see each of these three images, you know which uh, that you're entering into a new section of this presentation. But before I begin, uh, this presentation is going to start and end right here. This is the Brian Jones site. This is um, where they made the, the uh, paleo Indian discoveries a few years ago. And to paraphrase Mark Twain, this is where all the trouble began. <laughs> uh, they were going to build a bridge and that's what I'm standing on. You can see that they've graded it so that there's a parking um, spot for you to come down and actually see uh, the site. So I'm on Old Farms Road in Avon. I'm looking east. If you look carefully, can you see that bridge? Uh, we were, I was just there uh, taking that picture. Uh, the high ground rising above the bridge, however, is a long ridge and it's called the Metacomet Ridge. Uh, and it actually, you can find it Meriden, south of Meriden, and it goes all the way up to uh, Holyoke, Massachusetts. So this is just one small section of that ridge. Closer look, there's the famous bridge. There used to be a very narrow uh, two lane bridge and it would come, uh, there would be a steep incline to Route 10. So they um, replaced it with this industrial grade uh, bridge. And a closer look, 
there's the Farmington River. It's hard to tell from this picture, but the Farmington River is flowing northward right here. It's flowing from right to left. More about that later. The actual site is underneath this bridge, according to Terry, near this, but this bridge abutment. Um, my wife and daughter are um, also in the uh, photo so you can see them for scale. So first part, uh, why does the Farmington River flow northward in Avon, Connecticut? This is actually still the same site, but there's a boat launch there, uh, just in case you didn't know that. So the first thing I'd like to do is talk about what is a watershed. A watershed is a large area that is drained by um, a series of rivers that all eventually will flow into one. And the Connecticut River, the mighty Connecticut River, drains everything that you see in green. The Farmington River is just one tributary, one big tributary to the Connecticut. And the light green area that you see in the lower left is um, the Farmington River watershed. This is a map that's available from um, the Farmington River Watershed Association, uh, a group of uh, dedicated people uh, that are seeking to uh, make the river as clean as possible and take care of the environment and the surrounding areas. Uh, kudos to them. So this is the map of the Farmington River. It has its source in Beckett, Massachusetts. It travels through Beckett, Otis, Sandusfield before it enters into Connecticut. And eventually it joins on the right-hand side, it joins the Connecticut River in Windsor, Connecticut. So except for the Farmington River, all major tributaries to the west of the Connecticut River flow in an eastward direction, southern direction, or southeastward direction. I highlighted the uh, Farmington River, uh, and so you can see that it's not always the case. The Farmington River follows this pattern until it takes an abrupt turn in Farmington, Connecticut, and flows almost due north for many, many miles. Why is it doing that? The answer is glaciation. Over the last two million years, the um, glaciers that originated up in northern Canada flowed uh, down and I extended as far as you see that I over um, traced uh, that map and that's the most Southern ex uh, extent of the glaciers. So glaciers came down, they melted back up, they came down again, stayed around for a while and melted back up. This is what Connecticut looked like from the air for much of the last 2 million years during the ice age. Uh, no Route 44. The ice sheet was estimated to be about a mile or about 5,280 feet thick. The highest elevation in Connecticut is Bear Mountain at just over 2,300 feet. So everything was covered. Everything was covered. As the glaciers melted back, large meltwater lakes formed in the Farmington Valley. And there may have been times when the valley had a similar look to this photo. Uh, you notice that you see a lot of gymnosperms, a lot of firs, a lot of pines, etc. Those are the first trees that will get footing when um, the conditions are suitable for trees to grow. Glaciers melted back north and were completely absent from Connecticut approximately 20, 15,000 years ago. Left behind are glacial souvenirs such as sand, gravel, rounded rocks and boulders, and a disruptive drainage pattern for rivers. That leads us to the, the Farmington River. But if you look at Southern New England, this is the map that you see right here. Look at Cape Cod, that's a souvenir. It's all sand, no bedrock. Uh, according to the National Park Service, that's gonna be gone in 10,000 years, um, but you can still travel to it this summer. It'll still be there. Nantucket. Martha's Vineyard, all remains of the southernmost extent of the glacier. In addition to that map, I also outline in the lower left, Long Island and if, in green. And if you look at Long Island forms a fork. And if you look at the southernmost fork and follow those, those lines, those dotted lines, you see that from Montauk Point, it intersects with Block Island 
and you keep going northeast and it will intersect with all of the islands off of Cape Cod like Cuddy Hunt Island. If you look at the Northern Fork, Orient Point, you follow that straight line, it intersects directly with Fisher's Island. They all used to be connected, but due to erosion, the rising sea level, uh, a lot of the sand has been washed away and it will continue to do so. On a local level, there are a lot of rock souvenirs um, through all of New England. Picking stones, if you're a farmer, you know that you're doing a lot of picking stones in your fields. And so these are rocks probably untouched ever since the glacier uh, melted away. But if you look at all your stone walls, you will notice that most of the rocks have some rounded edges to them, if not oblong or perfectly, uh, almost perfectly spherical. That's because they've been rock tumbled by the glacier as it moved over this area. They also left behind sand and gravel. There's a sand and gravel pit um, in Portland, Connecticut. That's all uh, debris left uh, by the glacier as it was melting away. This photo was taken um, a year ago. Uh, this is the site across the street from the new Whole Foods on Route 44 in Avon, Connecticut. It, it looks like it's gonna be a parking lot. Notice that the sand left by the glacier glacial meltwater streams. So look how thick that sand is. And you may notice that there are white pines growing on top of it. White pines love to grow in sand. So why did the Farmington River take a sharp turn and flowed northward? High mounds of rocks, sand, gravel, boulders were dumped by melting glaciers and blocked the Farmington River from continuing to flow southeastward. So it's all because the glaciers dumped a load, the Farmington River couldn't make it and therefore it had to double back and it had to flow somewhere else. So it, I asked the question, hey, how does the Farmington River look when it's flowing southward or southeastward? Compared to how does it look when it flows northward? Does it look the same? So I traced the, the southeastern, the more normal direction in light blue and in a purplish color when it's flowing north. So how does it look? Well, I took that um, Farmington River Watershed Association map and I shrunk it in the upper left-hand corner. And you'll also see a red dot. This was taken by my daughter, uh, where Route 8 crosses the Farmington in Sandusfield, Massachusetts. So take a look at how it looks. It is flowing towards you. That means it's flowing from the north, flowing south. Notice that there are rocks on both riverbanks. There are rocks in the riverbed above water and the rocks that are just below water forming white water uh, conditions. So that's how the farming looks very near to its source. I'm gonna go move to the next slide. Look at the red dot, watch where I go next. Ready, three, two, one. Now I'm in New Hartford. I'm in Connecticut. New Hartford, for this little stretch, New Hartford is actually running parallel to Route 44 in New Hartford. It's right near the 219 um, Route 44 intersection, if you know where that is. That's actually Route 44 um, in the fog that you see there. You know, when I have to take pictures, I can't control the weather, um, like the internet. Uh, if you look at the Farmington River, you can see that it's much broader right now. There have been a lot of streams that have contributed their own particular volume to it. It's much broader, but you can see it's also moving very quickly. It's not a very um, placid uh, surface. It's actually moving quite rapidly right to left. It's moving from west to east. And you can still see that there are some rocks there, both um, un just under the water forming a rapids, as well as rocks uh, above the water. Watch the red dot. I'm now going to move just um, probably a quarter of a mile down the road. This is where the Farmington River intersects Route 44. I turned the camera so I'm looking due north. And so the river kind of turns from flowing west to east and now it's flowing due south. You can still see that there are some rocks on the riverbanks. There are certainly rocks in the middle. You can see that. Um, it's flowing quite rapidly because you don't have a nice glassy effect on the water. Watch the red dot. I'm now gonna go back to the Paleo Indian site where the 
river is now going to be flowing northward. So take a look at the red dot. Notice uh, the surface of the um, Farmington River. Three, two, one. We're back at the Paleo Indian site, Brian Jones site. Look at it. Same river. I took this probably 20 minutes later. It's now flowing from the south to the north. And you can see that it's kind of glassy. It's moving very slowly. Um, in, on my phone, I took the elevation back in New Hartford. Uh, I had an elevation of about 375 feet. Here, I took the elevation on two, uh, two separate days. I was getting something just over 130 feet. So the Farmington River had dropped about 200 feet. So it's in that ballpark, but you know, water likes to flow downhill. You know that. Look at it here, it's flowing northward. Most tributaries on the west side of the Connecticut River flow south, flow southeast, flow due east. They don't flow north. Look what's happening here. Now, watch the red dot. I'm now going to move farther, just farther north where Route 44 intersects the Farmington River for a second time. This is where Route 44 um, goes over the Farmington River. This is near the base of Avon Mountain, if you know where that is. It's once again, it's flowing from the south to the north. It's flowing very slowly. Um, it looks swollen, doesn't it? Um, it, it doesn't look like it's moving fast at all. This is the same river you saw in Sandusfield that you saw in New Hartford. Watch the red dot. Now I'm going to go up in Sim to Simsbury, a little farther north. So this is at the Flower Bridge in Simsbury. The Flower Bridge is taken care of by wonderful volunteers. They've turned this uh, one lane bridge. Uh, um, it's been replaced bridge has been converted to just pedestrians and they have lovely flowers you should visit at some time uh, quite extraordinary anyway I was in the middle of the bridge took this picture once again it's flowing from the south to the north look at how swollen it is it's quite shallow here um, and why is it shallow well on my phone I uh, the elevation at the paleo Indian site was about 132 feet here I got a register about 164 feet. Now that's not too much, but you know that water wants to flow downhill. It's here, it's flowing north and it's flowing slightly uphill. So if you think rolling a rock up a hill is a challenge, try pushing water up a hill. That's why the Farmington River looks so different um, when it flows northward versus when it flows um, southward. So once again, here's how it looks, much different. We'll come back to the Farmington River in a little bit. So can you count seven rock layers while driving on Route 44? The answer is of course, yes. So I took a close up um, of the uh, shaded relief map. You can see that on the left-hand image. Uh, in green, I traced Route 44. Uh, Route 10 coming up from the south, I traced in purple. And so you can, just to get your bearings straight, I went straight up Route 10 from the Paleo Indian site to the Route 44 intersection where the purple and the green intersect. What I want you to look at is the right-hand image. You, you still see the uh, Route 44, you still see Route 10, but suddenly you have these crazy stripes going on. That's what I want you to focus on. Let's take a close up look at this. This is, an, uh, this is a uh, uh, close up of the Connecticut bedrock uh, geologic map. Uh, and you can see where route 10 is just to orient yourself. You can see where route 44 is. But if you'll notice that there are seven colors here, this bedrock map wanted to show um, rocks that are the same type will have the same color. So as you go from left to right, you can count the different colors. You go from pink to kind of a uh, reddish color, 
to a mustard yellow to kind of an orangey red to a tan color to a peach color to a very light yellow straw yellow color seven layers here is my hokey map to show you the changes in elevation as you go from left to right notice in my drawing i have pink on the left i have yellow on the right but you can see a cross section of avon mountain i'll give you now a an enlargement of that drawing so you can uh, stop squinting please uh, so here is the um, enlargement of that uh, drawing. At the very top, west is on the left, east is on the right. The town of Avon is on the left, the town of West Hartford is on the right. Above the surface, you see that on the Avon side at the base of Avon Mountain, you see their intersection of Route 10 and Nod Road with Route 44. At the very top of Avon Mountain, you will see Eli Pond. You'll see an image of that. And then if you go, keep going to the east, at the bottom of Avon Mountain on the West Hartford side is the intersection of Mountain Road. And then if you keep going east towards Bishop's Corner, there's also an intersection with a road named Coolidge Road. I'll show you images of all of that. Look at the bottom half of this drawing. You see numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those are the seven layers. Now each layer is given a name, such as layer number one, New Haven Formation. A formation is a collection of rocks of the same general type, and they are given the name formation, usually, at least in Connecticut, but they also be, have, may be given some other names. New Haven. Is, was chosen because that is the area where the New Haven Formation was first scientifically described and published. Layer number two, the Talcott Basalt, so named as it was first described in, at Talcott Mountain in Simsbury. That little stripe, ye yellow stripe, layer number three, the Shuttle Meadow Formation. Shuttle Meadow is a section of Kensington which is a town right next to Great Britain, if you, if you know your geography. Layer four, the Holyoke Basalt, named for Holyoke, Massachusetts. Layer five, the East Berlin Formation, named for East Berlin, Connecticut. That's where it was first described. Layer six, the Hampton Basalt, named for Hampton, Massachusetts. And finally, the top layer, the youngest layer, is the Portland Arcos. Uh, that's layer number seven, named after uh, the famous rock quarries in Portland, Connecticut, and you'll see images of that. Okay, so those are um, the seven layers. Um, you don't need to memorize it. You'll see this image in a very small form as we go on. So where do you find rock outcrops or other, other evidence for, of each of the seven layers? Many times, many of you have driven by uh, a number of these if not live near a number of these. So I have my drawing in the upper left-hand corner in miniature. I have a little blue dot there just to show you kind of where you are. And this is the first layer. This is the oldest layer called the New Haven Formation. Uh, this is a shale outcrop on Nod Way, which is off of Nod Road in Avon. Shale, shale is a fine grain sedimentary rock. It used to be lake mud uh, at the bottom of a shallow lake about 190 million years ago. That's its age. And 190 million years means that it's at the very end of the Triassic period. If you like dinosaurs like me, the Mesozoic era is divided into three periods. The youngest, the first is the Triassic, then the Jurassic, then the Cretaceous. So now I'm going to um, Keep going. Uh, shale crumbles and erodes quite easily, which makes it useless as a building material. You can see that uh, during the freezing action of water and the thawing, uh, eventually is just going to um, reduce uh, this outcrop uh, to very, very fine uh, sections of shale. However, uh, farther west on Route 44, uh, the steps of the first Congregational Church, Avon Congregational Church, is made of sandstone. 
Uh, this is located at the Route 44, Route 10 intersection. Sandstone is a medium grain rock. The grains are a little bit larger and its sediments were found oftentimes on mudflats that rimmed ancient lakes during the rainy season. More about that later. Uh, Avon Town Hall buildings, they're also constructed of sandstone. Uh, if you go to the North House restaurant, uh, there's uh, the back section of it. Uh, it's located at the base of Avon Mountain and the oldest part of the restaurant shows it was built with local sandstone. And there actually used to be an active quarry nearby just up the slope a bit. And perhaps um, this uh, building was made from stone from that quarry. Kind of makes sense. Why drag it any farther than you have to? This is the Ensign House on Route 10 in Simsbury, Connecticut. This is a beautiful example of why Connecticut Valley Sandstone was quarried for its buildings, for its rock walls, for its bridges. Valued for the ease of cutting, its durability, its beauty. This real nice chocolate brown. Uh, and then I, I stopped actually at the bridge last summer uh, back at the Paleo Indian site and, and cleanup had just begun before the final landscaping touches and notice that most of the boulders, this is the New Haven formation, are sandstone. Uh, however, the boulder in the close and the lower right is made of basalt, which is an igneous rock. Uh, um, it was plucked from the Metacomet Ridge uh, farther north by a glacier, dragged southward and deposited when the glacier melted. Notice that all of the boulders that, that you see in this image have rounded, not sharp edges, more like, more like this. And that because glaciers can only drag and roll boulders this size. Certainly the Farmington River flowing northward couldn't touch this. Second layer of talcum basalt. Once again, I'm on uh, Nod Road in the wintertime. This is a view of Talcott Mountain looking east, southeast from Nod Road. Most of the cliff face is New Haven formation, sedimentary rock, but notice the capstone layer um, of bare rock is basalt. So you have the New Haven formation, but the very top is basalt. Um, basalt is formed from cooled lava and basalt is a different type of rock called an igneous rock. Uh, comes from Latin, which means fire. Uh, it's resistant to weathering and erosion because it's made of interlocking crystals and um, oh, it also contains iron, which uh, makes basalt hard and durable. Here's another um, photo of the Talcott basalt at the very top. 